theme of demonstration and proclamation I've introduced it the last couple of weeks, and I really feel like that's the heart of the book of Acts, and I really feel like that's the heart of the church, that this is what God has designed us for. God has designed us as a church to be a church that both demonstrates and proclaims the gospel, or the shorthand version of that is to show it and to tell it. So we are supposed to both show and tell the gospel, and I'm going to go through the entire chapter of Acts 2 today, because I think it's so pivotal in the life of the church. I feel like this sets up the rest of the book of Acts, and everything from the rest of the book of Acts comes back to this, that there's demonstration of the power of God through the Holy Spirit, and then there's an explanation or an announcement or a proclamation of the gospel. So we're going to take some time to look at the entire chapter today, and we're going to go back to Pentecost, and last week I briefly talked about the actual event of Pentecost. I mostly referred to the Holy Spirit, and then went in some different directions. We talked about the Holy Spirit and power, and we talked about the Holy Spirit and prophethood. But today we're actually going to go right through this chapter, line by line, and we're going to look at how there's a demonstration, and then there's a proclamation. So first again, to give you the setting, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Well, what's Pentecost? Pentecost, the Jewish Spring Harvest Festival. Started with first fruits, where they got the first fruits and they waved them, and then they counted off seven sevens, or seven weeks, and it became known as the Feast of Weeks. That's where you get your 49, and the day after that is 50. Pentecost, for 50 days, in this Spring Harvest Festival. It was right after Passover, and it also got associated with the giving of the law where Moses led the uh, people out of Egypt. They were in the desert, and then 50 days later, he went up on the mountain, received the giving of the law. So those were the two reasons that the Jewish people would celebrate this festival. And that's why there were so many gathered from all these different countries here in Jerusalem at this time. And so there were Jewish people from all these different nations gathered in Jerusalem, and of the apostles or followers of Christ, it's about 120 that we hear from Acts 1. And they are gathered together in unity and in prayer. And in uh, Acts 1, it talks about this, that they are gathered together in unity and in prayer because Jesus said, don't leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift that I'm about to give you. For you've been baptized in water, but in a few days you're going to get baptized in the Holy Spirit. So stay there. So uh, they were on the Mount of Olives. They were just a short distance away from Jerusalem. They went back to Jerusalem. They were in this upper room. And they're gathered together now. And it's the day of Pentecost, this feast day. And while they're there, suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind from heaven filled the house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak in other tongues or other languages as the Spirit enabled them. So this is the sign. This is the demonstration. There's really three things that come about. There's a violent wind. And I talked last week about how I believe that violent wind was a signal of power. Because wind, breath, and spirit are all the same word in the Greek and Hebrew. And so in John, Jesus breathed on his disciples and said, Receive the Holy Spirit, but that was a breath. It was not a strong force. And it was designed to signify, I believe, in Genesis when God was shaping out of the dirt and breathed breath into that and it became a living being. And I believe that John there was signifying new life. But here in Acts, we see a violent wind which signifies power. We know that tornadoes and other violent winds that happen can destroy things or move things or rearrange things. There's definitely an effect that you feel. There's power that comes when there's a strong wind. And so then thirdly here, we see, or second, we see tongues of fire. There's this demonstration of fire splitting and coming to rest on each of them. And then thirdly, we hear them speaking in unlearned foreign languages. They didn't train. <laughs> Jesus didn't say, now, stay here and study hard all these foreign languages, because on the day of Pentecost, I want you to speak them. They didn't learn them ahead of time. They just spoke them supernaturally by the power of the Holy Spirit. So these three things together become a sign or a demonstration of the Holy Spirit. And it says in verse 5, They were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And when they heard this sound, in verse 6, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, Are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? Now, while they were all Jewish, they all had lived in these different places of the world, and they picked up those native tongues. 
They probably all knew Hebrew or Aramaic of some sort as their Jewish cultural language. But they day to day in the marketplace were speaking these other languages where they lived. And they were hearing all these languages being spoken by these apostles. And this is a sign, it's a demonstration of the power of the Spirit that day. And then it goes through the list of the different places where they came from. And at the end of that, verse 11, it says, We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues, our languages. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, What does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said they've had too much wine. Now, I'm guessing these are the ones who didn't speak these languages. <laughs> Because I've never known anybody to take a lot of wine and then speak a, a known language that they didn't know before. I don't know if that's a way to gain fluency in foreign languages. <laughs> like, drink a lot of wine, you'll get fluent in another language. I don't, I don't know that that's a path to that. So, they probably didn't understand this. It seemed like a mindless Bible to them. They probably were the local people. They only spoke maybe Hebrew or Aramaic. And they said, these people are crazy. And because of the power of the Holy Spirit, the joy they were experiencing, they probably looked a little high. They were really enjoying the presence of God. They were speaking out these other things. And it looked like craziness to them, or mindless babble, or drunkenness. So you have three reactions here to this demonstration. One is amazement. Like, wow, something amazing just happened. The second is confusion. Okay, I'm not sure what's going on. What is this all about? I'm bewildered. And the third is skepticism, or cynicism, or anger even, maybe. What are they doing? Let's mock them. Let's make fun of them, or we don't like this. And so there's always going to be the possibility of all three of those whenever the Spirit is demonstrated in people's lives. You may not get all three every time as a demonstration of the Spirit, but there's the possibility of all three every time as a demonstration of the Spirit. Every time you do something being led by God's Spirit, there's the possibility of these three responses. Amazement, confusion, and skepticism or cynicism. I mean, when you step in and you be nice to people or you just be kind to people, do kind of what we consider maybe less supernatural stuff, but you're still doing it, being motivated by the power of God, there's going to be some who may question your motives. Some who may be skeptical about why you're doing what you're doing. Some cynicism there. And you may be doing it because you want to honor God or you feel like the Spirit's prompting you to do so, but there could be cynicism there. And so recognize that anytime you do something for God, there's possible amazement, confusion, and cynicism. But that opens the door. That showing opens the door then for the telling. The demonstration opens the door for the proclamation. At that moment, then you have the opportunity to respond. And in verse 13, it says, Some are made fun of them, they have had too much wine. So the amazed and, and, and perplexed people say, What does this mean? The skeptical people say they've had too much wine, and now Peter gets to address both of those groups. He's responding to their response to the demonstration. And so in 14, he gets up with the other 11. He raised his voice and he addressed the crowd. And they didn't have amplification systems. <laughs> and to raise your voice so you can speak out to this crowd. So Peter begins to speak, and this is what he shares. He says, fellow Jews, Recognize, that's who he's talking with. This is a Jewish crowd this day. It says, fellow Jews, and all of you live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. I'm going to tell you what this is. Because some people are saying, what does this mean? Some are saying, they have too much wine. I'm going to explain this to you. First of all, they're not drunk. <laughs> as you suppose, he says. Or maybe as some of you suppose. <laughs> it's only 9 in the morning. That doesn't mean I've never seen a drunk person at 9 in the morning. I did college ministry. <laughs> I've seen people on homecoming weekend drunk by 9 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> but that wasn't typical of these Jewish festivals. They were starting their day. They were starting their day honoring the Lord. The Jewish festival is too early in the day for the drunkenness to occur. He says, no, this is not, well, this is only 9 in the morning. This is what was spoken by the prophet Joel, and he quotes Joel from Joel 2, 28 to 32. And he says, this is what you're seeing. This is what God promised us hundreds of years ago. Joel spoke it forth, and now you are seeing it. This is an amazing day for you. And then he goes on in 22, and look at the rest of the message. The rest of the message is all about Jesus, and that's the heart of the gospel. That's the heart of the good news, the kingdom of Jesus. And he goes on to talk about the life of Jesus, interestingly enough, following the church calendar. <laughs> if you think about the church calendar, really, he follows it straight through. 
And I'm going to show you five things that he talks about in the life of Jesus that goes right through this. <clears throat> and I'm not saying that other ways of sharing the good news are wrong or bad. I think there's a lot of good in them. But I want you to recognize that on this day, to these Jewish people, what Peter does is he shares the cycle of the life of Jesus. He doesn't share Romans Road. Of course, Romans hasn't been written yet. But he doesn't share that concept. He doesn't go into four spiritual laws. He says, here's the life of Jesus. And he recaps the life of Jesus. And it starts at 22, and he says this. Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did among you through him as you yourselves know. Why as you yourselves know? Because this is only 50 days after Jesus was on the cross. A half a year ago, Jesus was doing all of this. And just a few months ago, he came into Jerusalem. Just a few months ago, he came and raised Lazarus from the dead. This is fresh. This is recent. This is not something like us now looking back 2,000 years. This is something looking back in Jerusalem, the very place where Jesus just rose Lazarus from the dead a few months ago. This is fresh. And he's telling them that this man, Jesus, was accredited by God, and you know this. He did these signs. He did these wonders. He did these miracles. You guys have heard about Lazarus and what he did there. This is all recent. But if you think about it, in the life of Jesus, he doesn't mention Christmas here. But really, this covers Christmas to Monday, Thursday. Jesus was born. Jesus lived among us. He lived a life of love. He lived a life of servanthood. He lived a life of miracles. He lived a life of amazing teaching. This is the life of Jesus. And I want you to recognize when you are sharing the good news with people, you don't have to give all five of these at one sitting like Peter did. But at any given moment, you can be ready to share these five things about Jesus. And one might be the actual life of Jesus. For some, the life of Jesus may be the most intriguing thing or the most connecting point to the demonstration you just had. Why are you doing this? Well, there's a man named Jesus, and I'm a follower of his, and he did stuff like this. He served people. He loved people, and that's why I'm doing this. So I wanted you to know about Jesus. He was a man who served. That was his lifestyle. Monday, Thursday, he washed feet. He broke bread with his disciples. He taught amazing things. So the next one now here, if you go to verse 23, this man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. What's that good Friday? He got nailed to the cross. And he accuses them. These people likely were not directly involved. But he's saying you, the nation of Israel, with the help of wicked men, you put him to death. You put this man who did these amazing things to death. And there's the cross. And that's a great part of our gospel presentation. Anytime we need to or should, we can, we can proclaim that Jesus died on the cross. Jesus shed his blood. And in so doing, he removed all of our sin. He who knew no sin became sin for us on the cross. He, he took it. He knows suffering. He knows death. He experienced it. Good Friday. Second part of the good news that he shares today. The third part of the good news that he shares, verse 24, and this is our Easter message. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. That's great news. Jesus was dead, yes, but he is alive now. And Jesus lives. And he's able to share this with them. That's Easter. Jesus rose from the dead. See, we don't want to leave people with the impression that Jesus is just a dead man. <laughs> he did die, yes, but Jesus is alive. Jesus defeated death. And then he goes on to quote a psalm here, and he talks about how David shared, and how David gave this prophecy about the Messiah. And then in verse 31, it says, Seeing what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see the king. 32, God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of this fact. <clears throat> Those 120 that were gathered in that room had seen him alive. Peter had seen him alive. 
Thomas had put his finger through the holes. There are eyewitnesses to this fact. Now, we aren't the same type of eyewitnesses. We haven't seen the risen Jesus in the same way, but we have experienced the risen Lord in our lives. And we can share the resurrection of Jesus. They, on this day, are, are the eyewitnesses of it, and they're sharing that Jesus is raised from the dead. Number four, exalted to the right hand of God. What's that? Ascension. Forty days after, what did Jesus do? He ascended to heaven. That's the fourth part of the good news he shares. Ten days ago, Jesus ascended. And then he sits enthroned now in heaven as Lord of all. And he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit. Today's Trinity Sunday on the church calendar. And guess what you see here? He, Jesus, received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit. The three in one. Jesus Father, Holy Spirit, the Trinity at work. And he has poured out the Holy Spirit, which what? You now see and you now hear. This demonstration is the work of the Holy Spirit. And that's Pentecost. So if you think about it, he just basically shares the church calendar as the good news. Jesus was born and lived and he did amazing miracles and he served and he loved. And then... Good Friday, he suffered and died on the cross and bled. Then Easter, he rose from the grave. Ascension Day, he went back to the Father. And Pentecost, he poured out the Holy Spirit. So I want you to recognize that all five of those are aspects of the good news. And you can use all five of those when you're sharing the good news. You don't have to do it all in one sitting. But you can use whatever slice of that fits the moment, whatever demonstration was just given, you can use that to connect to the good news of what Jesus did. Born, lived, died, resurrected, ascended, and poured out the Holy Spirit. So what's the response to this? In verse 37 it says, The people were cut to the heart. That's the work of the Holy Spirit inside them. The work of the Holy Spirit outside is a demonstration. They see the wind, they see the tongues of fire, they hear the languages, but inside, the Holy Spirit has to cut their heart. And that's what will open people up to the gospel. Any demonstration that I give, any explanation I give, won't do a thing unless the Holy Spirit cuts into their heart. The Holy Spirit has to open them. And that's our prayer for people. The Holy Spirit will open them, that they will feel the conviction, that they will be convinced that Jesus is Lord and want to follow Him. And so that's the changing point. They've seen the demonstration, they've had the explanation, and while the word is being preached, the Holy Spirit convicts their hearts, and now they're ready to respond. They say, what shall we do? So what do you tell people? What shall we do? So Peter has a chance now to reply to them and tell them, here's what you should do. Repent. Change your mind. Change your direction. And be baptized. Get in water so that people know that you have made a decision. You see, in the book of Acts, the how you know people have made decisions to follow Jesus is whether they got baptized or not. They're telling them to make a decision to follow Jesus. I'm not saying that, that the baptism is, is an act of salvation or anything like that, but that's the public commitment. That's when they move forward. You don't see in the book of Acts an altar call, although I'm not saying they, they didn't have things like that. What they had was, will you get baptized? Are you ready to make a public decision to show people that you want to follow Jesus? And for them, they got in the water and that was their commitment. That was them saying yes to Jesus. That was them receiving Jesus as Lord and Savior. Repent, turn around, commit your mind and heart to Jesus, and then get baptized. Every one of you, in the name of Jesus, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So when you receive Jesus as Lord, you get at least two things. You get your sins forgiven, and you get the Holy Spirit. Two things everybody gets when Jesus becomes your Lord. Your sins are washed clean, past, present, and future, and you get the presence of God through the Holy Spirit in your life. And he said this promise is for you, this promise is for your children, and this promise, promise is for all who are far off, for all who the Lord our God will call. Not just Jewish people. Although at that time, that's what this was. But he's saying there's a foretaste here. There's going to be all who are far off. 
all who the Lord our God will call. All these languages that we use. Yes, you're all Jewish today, but these languages are also meant for those in those nations who are not Jewish. We are to be a, a blessing to the Gentiles, and all nations will be blessed through us. For all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call, receive the Holy Spirit. So how do you respond to the good news? Help people to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus. And then help them know when they turn their heart to Jesus, they'll receive forgiveness of all their sins. And they'll receive the presence of God through the Holy Spirit. And then what happens in verse 42? It says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. I believe those are four commitments that we should help people make if they're ready to follow Jesus. And in your own life, I hope that you're committing to these things or recommitting to these things on a regular basis. Because these are things that daily and weekly we have to make decisions to do. These are not things you make a one-time decision for. You can make a one-time decision to be baptized. I'm not going to say every week, come up here and get baptized. That'd be a lot of baptizing. <laughs> You do that once. You've made your decision. You're following Jesus. You're baptized. But these things you have to do daily and weekly. The apostles' teaching. We don't have the apostles here with us right now. I can't say, well, go on down to the church where Peter's preaching and go listen to him. <laughs> I mean, Peter gave his life. He got crucified upside down. He is no longer here on this planet with us. You can't just say, yeah, go on now, listen to John or listen to James. Instead, you have to listen to me. <laughs> so what I try to do is show you the things that got recorded, the things that got written down, the things that church said, this is acceptable and good teaching from the apostles. So commit yourself to it. How do you get that? From the scripture. You read it on a daily basis. You hear it preached on a weekly basis. <laughs> You study with other believers. Get the apostles teaching. You're going to get that through the scriptures. Second thing is fellowship. This is not a solo deal. This is not go out and be a Christian by yourself. This is committing to the community. I am a part of the community of faith. I'm part of the body of Christ. And I'm committed to that. And that means you have to get together with other believers on a regular basis. And weekly we have an opportunity here with Sunday school and Sunday worship. If you want to come out to... Uh, Green Sport and join some Nettle Creek people in Bible study, you're welcome to do so. Bible study, fellowship, or other opportunities that are out there. But commit to community, fellowship. We have women's group be meeting again in the fall. We have men's groups that meet. These are ways you can get together with the community. Third one is breaking of bread. And I believe this includes meals and communion. And at this church, we're good at doing both. <laughs> We've upped communion now to once a month, first Sunday of every month. So if you come the first Sunday of every month, you get an opportunity to receive communion. Used to be tied together. Why? Because Alexander Mack and the early uh, leaders of the Church of the Brethren movement believed that the love feast was the setting for communion. He took the meal and communion and the feet washing all together. So they didn't separate the two. But breaking of bread, meals, and communion... We offer meals, fellowship meals. We have community picnics. We have all kinds of stuff, chicken and dumplings, ways that we can eat together. So eating together and communion together, and then finally prayer. You have the Holy Spirit with you. Talk to Him. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine going day after day after day with the Holy Spirit with you and not even acknowledging that He's there? <laughs> You've got the Holy Spirit with you. Talk to Him. And then let him talk to you. Say, Holy Spirit, I'm so glad you're with me. I'm so glad that you reside with me. And that you want to teach me and train me and mold me and shape me. And, and help me to live the life that you have for me. And guide my life and help me know you. You have the opportunity every day to talk to God. And for God to talk to you. So commit to those things. But those are things you have to commit to regularly. Daily and weekly. And then finally, demonstrate and proclaim the kingdom. It says in verse 43, As they were doing these things, everyone was filled with awe. Many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. So the demonstrations of the kingdom continued. It wasn't a one-time deal. 
And all the believers were together and had everything in common. By their life together, they were demonstrating the kingdom. Selling their possessions and goods, they gave to anyone as he had need. In other words, they were committed to each other as a sign of the kingdom. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts. They praised God and they enjoyed the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So as they were living a lifestyle of demonstrating the kingdom, they had opportunities to tell others why they were living that way, and God was adding to their number daily. Now one day it went from 120 to 3,120. The part I skipped over said so they baptized 3,000. That's church growth. <laughs> Maybe next week we get 3,000 people here for me to baptize. <laughs> Peter can join 290 or 2,999 others. <laughs> That'd be a long day. <laughs> we need lots of towels. But they they go from 120, 3,120, then they continue to grow daily. And a little bit later in the book of Acts, it says they were up to 5,000. And now, around the world, we're up to 2 billion and counting. Some of you have seen the U.S. debt clock, and how it keeps every second going up. Every day around the world, people come to know Jesus. Every day, there is an increase in believers. If you had a, you, a believer, a number, it'd be going up every day. Believers following Jesus. Lately, a lot of the growth has come from South America, Africa, and Asia. The last hundred years or so. But it has continued to grow for 2,000 years up to now over 2 billion followers of Jesus on this planet. From the original 120 on the day of Pentecost gathered. God is at work. The church is growing through demonstration and proclamation. And we commit ourselves to showing the gospel and telling the gospel. We'll have the opportunity to influence people as they get cut to the heart. And we'll see people get saved. We'll see people come to know Jesus. We'll see people repent. We'll see people get baptized. So let's do our part. Let's show people Let's tell people and let's commit to the areas we're to commit to. Daily, let's commit to Scripture. Daily, let's commit to prayer. Weekly, let's commit to gathering with other believers. And weekly, let's commit to the fellowship. Let's pray together. God, I pray today that you will bless all of us that are here with your presence. That we would experience a genuine work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. That we would sense you at work that we would hear your voice and that we would experience you this week. Some of us today may need to repent. Some of us today may need to say, I want to get baptized. I want to follow Jesus. And I pray if that's the case that you would work on people's hearts to do so. Some of us today need to, this week, encounter you in Scripture and encounter you in prayer and come back again to join with other believers in, in worship and in Bible study and in prayer and taking communion. And God, I pray that you will work in our lives now. And we thank you for your presence through Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. We're going to stay